precious chastisement, that name in and of itself is kind of like an oxymoron. It works against itself. But I'd like to show you tonight, as we began showing you this morning, that there is a precious truth about how God deals with us who know Jesus Christ, who have been born again, who who have put all their faith in Jesus Christ alone and are not trusting in their religion and not trusting in their sacrament, not trusting in the things that they, the ordinances that they go through and vows as far as something that they can do, but it's all hanging on Christ. They've become a child of God the Father, and he deals with you and your life with chastisement. Let's go to him in prayer, and we're going to see the second part of this tonight. Father, I just pray that you would let the word of God run tonight. I pray that every, every, uh, everything you'd like to do would be uh, completed. I pray, keep me, a, uh, keep me clear. Let me have a clear mind. Help me to be able to bring forth God's word. I pray that you'll keep the people awake and help me to be interesting enough to keep them awake. I pray that they would cling on to the word of God and not on entertainment of, of some speaker. I do ask, Lord, that we would love the word. Father, thank you that you are a loving father. You're not a deadbeat dad. Lord, you do care about us, and you care enough to step in like a good dad would. When we go astray and we are away from you, when we are tolerating things in our life that uh, disgraces your glory, things in our life that hurts our, fel- our fellowship with you, as Pastor Cruz prayed, and uh, things in our life that are ju- just smack against your holiness, Lord, you step in and I thank you for that. Help us as we look at these passages tonight. I pray, Lord, that it would be good for us to be here and uh, we would grow and change in Jesus' name, amen. Right now in this congregation, God is chastening individual believers. I do not have to question that. I do not have to say probably at all because of the clear passages of the New Testament about God's chastening. He is doing it. Remember we talked about chastening this morning being kind of two different perspectives, not perspectives. Let me, let me, let me go back on that. That there are two parts to the chastening of the Lord. One is what he does daily. The education of a child, the, the education and the correcting and the, the, uh, the, the changing in the life of a child. The other one is, is corrective in the way of discipline. And God, when, when we come to the place where we are not following him, what our father says, and we are disobeying him, at some point he steps in. God is chastening individual believers in this congregation. He is allowing pain and trials and disappointments and tensions of different types and tragedies to come into our lives. It's not because he wants to see us suffer. You know, God is not sadistic. God is not, oh, I'm going to torture and I'm going to let bad things happen to my children. It's not because of that. It's really not, and I want you to think about this at home, but it's really not because his justice must punish the justified. He doesn't, he doesn't do this to us, chastening to us, really, uh, theologically, because his justice has to be appeased. It was appeased in the cross. It was appeased in Christ. He does not need to punish us. We are justified. It's not really because he is trying to make us unhappy. No, it's quite the opposite. You'll see tonight it's because he loves you. And you're his child now by Christ. It is because he loves you. Turn then to Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse number 3. Hebrews, in your Bible, it's one of the hardest uh, uh, books of the Bible for me to find. Okay, That's why I saved the place and I'm already there. Hebrews chapter 12, please. As you turn there, the beginning of this passage is the great passage about marathon of keep on running, throwing off the, 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 the uh, weights and the sins that so easily beset you, etc. And then we come to verse number three. Would you stand, please, as we read it? Hebrews 12, beginning in verse number three. Give you a second to get there. We all see it. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 3, For consider him, that's Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds when opposition, when contradiction comes in your life. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, and here this is a quote from the Old Testament, my son, You've forgotten this. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. 
If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. If it comes in your life, God dealeth with you as sons, your son. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, or all saved are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, you know, dads on this earth, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Question mark. For they which for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, that doesn't, look up here, that doesn't mean our dad spanked us because they liked it or pleasure. It means they were doing what they thought was good. Okay, keep reading. For verily, for a few days, chastened us uh, after their own pleasure, what they thought was good, but he for our profit, God for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyful, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Where, wherefore, lift up the, the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but, but, but let it rather be healed. The last verse, the idea there is that you are wounded, that you're going the wrong direction, but God, by chastening, is going to heal you. You may be seated. It's a very odd thing to me, really, that this most famous passage on chastening in the Bible, it is introduced in verse number three uh, and four with the point of don't be discouraged when enemies of Christ and when enemies are, uh, of our, in our culture, those that want to follow after sin and want to contradict you and want to really oppress you, don't be discouraged, don't stay discouraged when your culture oppresses you because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You know, that's not really surprising anymore. And, and in America, that is quite, you know, in, in your workplaces, you know, in your families, there, there are probably many that are oppressed in some way or the other, persecuted or contradicted because you're a follower of Christ. It starts out, this great passage on chastening that says, don't be discouraged when that happens. That persecution and oppression points, that point about that opens the door to the conversation we started this morning about chastening. I never would start that way. And that's why I'm not God and why I didn't get to write, get to write the Bible at all. <laughs> you know, he starts a way by showing us that even persecution... Even when unsaved people strike against you, even God is using that many times for chastening to bring you to righteousness, for chastening to make you conform to the, to the image of Jesus Christ. I never would have thought of that. I never would have thought of that. I never would have knew that. That's how we introduce this, this extreme or this strange way that the Lord even uses persecution to chasten us sometimes, unsaved people to bring us to holiness to him. That's a strange thing. God uses all kinds of discipline to correct his children. You know, you can't, I can't by the end of this service, I'll never be able to put my finger on exactly the way that he may chasten you because he just uses so many different types of things as we refer to in the morning service, even goodness, even good things. And of course, all of our perse- or, or all of our Uh, The things that go on in our life, trials, are for the good, but he may even bring good things in your life to chasten you. And that blows my mind, but God is not limited by how he will get you to obey him. He's not limited how he will get your attention. He is not limited of what he needs to bring in your life. He's almost limitless with that. So let's study again, jump into the chastening of the Lord tonight. I want you to notice in this passage as we look here, notice please that when times get hard, When there's contradiction in your life, there's trials in your life, verse 3 and 4, that we must not forget that the Lord uses chastening in our lives. We must not forget what's going on. You know, sometimes it may be very tempting to just say, I'm going to get through this. And we go into the mode of endurance. We go into the mode of just thinking, pray for me and all that kind of thing. Okay, there's something else you need to do. Perhaps you need to understand that the Lord may be chastening you to deal with some attitude that you will not judge in yourself, to deal with some action of sin, to deal with some disobedience. So it's not always go into the please pray for me mode. You know, there should be a healthy believer would say, Lord, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. 
We need to remember that when things get tough, that the Lord uses chastening in our lives through tough circumstances. God gives one of the reasons in verse number three not to be weary and to faint in life. Down in verse number five, notice what it says, please. It says, verse five, and ye have forgotten that the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. They were coming under persecution, and he says, hey, you know what? It could be God chastening you and dealing with you harshly about things. Don't forget that he does that. And that is the hardship that may cause you to want to quit on the Lord. The hardship that causes you to want to chuck it and give up and Stop following the Lord closely and stop reading your Bible. What's the use? All these bad things going on. That may be the Lord directly chasing you to bring you closer to him. Don't forget it. Well, Lord, if you love me, you wouldn't bring these bad things into my life. And the Lord says very gently, no, I bring the bad things in your life because I love you. Boy, that's different than the world teaches, isn't it? The Lord uses this. We must not forget it is designed from above. So what is chastening? We we talked a lot this morning, but to review from this morning, the word is used in many New Testament passages, at least nine, and is understood in the realm of child rearing. We talked about that, educating a child, rebuking them at times, forming their character, instructing them. The same word is translated in your your English New Testament as nurture, instruction, teaching, chastening, all the same idea, all the same word, all what God is doing, all what the Father is doing to deal with you as his beloved children. It is a word meaning to correct or teach something or someone, excuse me, by means that is often painful and, and inflicting evil or calamity, not evil in the way of sin, but in the way of rough stuff. Calamity. Of course, the illustration later on in verse number 9 through 10 is corporal punishment or the spanking of children to correct them. And that's not generally what we're talking about right now, child rearing, but it is the illustration used in verse 9 and 10. Look what it says. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, and it goes on. Corporal punishment. The word was used of Pilate chastening in Luke 23 and verse 16 when he wanted to chastise Jesus and let him go. He wanted to chasten him or inflict pain on him and then let him go. The idea is always teaching something. When God uses chastisement in our life, in the verses, it's always corrective It's always corrective, not punitive. What do I mean by punitive? The electric chair is punitive, okay? Punitive is when you bring pain just for the sake of of retribution on what the person has done. That's not how God deals with his children. And by the way, that's not how we should deal with our our babies either, our children either, okay? We don't don't deal with them punitively. We deal with them corrective. You know, uh, Amy and I always, you know, have kidded that, that uh, and it's true. It's it's I mean, it's not really a joke, but that there is a direct you know wire, a direct line from you know a child's bottom to their heart, and that's true. Those of you who are consistent with child discipline, you know that that is true. There's something you know changing about that when it's done the right way, not ever in anger, but consistently. The idea of chasing is always to teach something, correctively, not punitive. It is, it is pain. It is not pain without purpose. It is pain with purpose. It is pain with purpose to yield the fruit of righteousness and holiness in a believer in a particular situation. That language is right out of verse number 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joy, joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, here it is, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised there, thereby. When the Lord chastens you, he's doing it with a purpose. He wants to bring that peaceable fruit, fruit of righteousness. Notice this passage in verse number five through six. Look at it again when he says, I want to remind you of something. Beginning halfway through five, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. It goes on. It's a quote from the book of Proverbs of all places. 
Proverbs 3, 11 through 12. It'd be good if you're a Bible marker that in the margin that you would, sh- you would write the cross-reference of where, what he's quoting. He says, don't you forget, like things are getting hard, you want to quit on God? Don't forget that God uses hardship to chasten you. Think about that. It is on purpose many times. We are told as children of the Lord not, not to hate it when God brings pain into our lives. We need to appreciate that he is not a deadbeat dad. He is involved in discerning the lives and the actions of his children. He loves them and doesn't let them uh, run wild and stay in sinful situations in their lives. Listen, dads, listen, the good dads in here, and I'm not judging anyone, the good dads in here, you pay attention to what is going on in the attitudes of your children. And you pay attention of how your children are running. You pay attention of their life, of what directions they're heading, and the influences of their friends, and, and friends that they should not have, and so you step in. Good dads, step in. Good dads, deal with their children. Deadbeat dads, ignore the children, and let the children do what they want to do. Or deadbeat dads, listen, oh, you're going to get me mad. Deadbeat dads allow only the wife, the, the mother, to worry about the discipline of, listen, dad, step up. The responsibility of rearing their child, your children in the New Testament is given to you, to you, fathers. Fathers are told to bring their children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We are not to provoke our children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Dads, you are the disciplinarian of your home. You are responsible to step in and, and deal with discipline. And listen, friend, If you are at home, don't you let your wife do the discipline. You need to do it. And when your children are old enough to understand, their mama needs to say, wait until your father gets home. And when your father gets home, that there is really something that happens. That's biblical, but it's way off track. The Lord here rebukes you because he's a good dad. He's a good father, and it will hurt. But don't faint or quit on him when he does it, verse 5 says. He's doing it because he loves you, and he needs to firmly correct something inside of you. He's doing something in you. Again, verse 6 says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He wants you to understand this is a loving thing, a good thing. Listen, children don't always understand when they're disciplined that it's because of love from their parents. In fact, they got this grunge attitude, I think my dad did this, I don't deserve it. My dad's so mean. No, your dad loves you. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't discipline you. The Lord loves us, so he chastens us as a father. You say, I thought God loved the whole world. Why, why is it specifically talking about the, 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 him disciplining and chasing his children as a, an act of love? Doesn't he love everyone? Well, he loves everyone by way of him being the maker and pitying them as their creator and wanting them to come to repentance, but he does not love the, the world like he loves the children of his grace through Jesus Christ. The world is not all children of the Father. Jesus was very clear when he said to the religious leaders, you are of your father the devil. This passage calls them bastards, all right? Okay, if you have not been born again, you are not his child. He loves you generally in a creation sense, but not as heirs of his grace. You are his pride and joy if you are saved. His precious child that he loves and chose to pour his grace upon. He loves you so much that he has to discipline you so, sometimes to correct your direction. You know, one of thing, it, and it's good for me to understand that our sanctification isn't all up to us. You know, God has a hand in this. He doesn't just say, hey, go sanctify yourself. Hey, go become more like the image of Christ. He doesn't do that. No, he's involved. He's involved in in overseeing that change in your life. Notice in verse number six that he does this to every son and daughter. Look at six, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That is, every child of God, everyone who is saved is chastened of the Lord. So when the trials and the hardship comes, remember point number one, the Lord may be engaging in chastisement in your life. And maybe you shouldn't, you should look at it that way first. Point number two in the passage, notice verse seven and eight, if you do not receive chastisement from the Lord, then you are not his child. Look what 7 and 8 says. If you endure chastisement, God deals with you as sons. 
For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. That is the right use of the word bastards. He is not cussing. He's saying that God is not your father. This is where we need to distinguish chastisement a little bit. It's not just pain and troubles that come into your life. Every person has, every person, every person that has been saved, every person that has been saved will receive chastisement. Notice that verse 7 and 8 is giving you a test of your salvation. It's not just a matter of trials that come to your life. We all have, you know, just the matter of the world. Life is hard, especially in a downturn economy. You know, life is hard, okay? So all of us have trials in, in the world. That's not chastisement. Unsaved and saved people have trials. That's not chastisement. There's something more specific here. It is the specific chastening of his children when they will not judge themselves and stop doing habitual sin in their life. That is the point that proves whether you are his child or not. If God allows you to roll in your sin or if he steps in. Now I want you to see kind of a hard passage. So if you're not awake, uh, you know, blah, 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 shake yourself and we're going to, I want you to think even harder. So turn now to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. I want to show you a passage that goes along with this and with the idea that a, a, a child of God cannot just continue on in, you know, living in habitual willful sin, okay? It is a, a huge test of salvation. It is a huge proof of salvation that the child of God does not do this, cannot do it. So look at 1 John chapter 3. I want to begin in verse number 2. And I want you to think down through this, okay? It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. One of the greatest verses in all the Bible. Verse 3, and every man that hath this hope, what hope? That he's a child of God, that he's a son of God, that he's saved, purifieth himself, even as Jesus is pure, even as God is pure. So he's in this process of purifying himself, or he is seeking to be pure. That is his goal. That is what he's chasing day by day. Verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he, Jesus, was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now look up here a moment. There is a grammar thing going on here, and I'm going to tell you as we continue to reading it so you'll understand. This is not talking about that you don't know Jesus Christ if you commit a sin someday, now, today, whatever, yesterday, tomorrow. The, the grammar is this. It doesn't come out so well in our English. It is very clear in the Greek text that the Lord spoke this sin and wrote this sin. It is talking about this word commit, someone who is living in habitual, willful sin. He is committing sin. He is continuing to commit sin. He is willfully, with his will, committing sin. He is not purifying himself. He is choosing day by day to live in sin. That's the word commit here. Keep reading. Verse 6, whosoever abideth in him in Jesus sinneth not. That's the same thing. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness lives cons consistently in righteousness, is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, that is, lives habitually in the committing of sin, is of the devil. Man, that's strong. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Does, he doesn't live in sin. Why? For his seed, God's seed, remaineth in that guy, in him. And he cannot sin because he is, say the last three words, he is what? Born of God. In this the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. This is strong stuff here. It is very strong. Let's talk about it. Here's the argument. It has a lot to do with chastisement. You'll, get to, you'll see it in a minute. Here's the argument, all right? 
A child of God purifies himself in verse 3. That's what he lives for day by day. He wants to become like Jesus Christ. He is growing towards that, that thing, okay? He's already saved. That's not going to save him. He is doing that. He wants to be like Jesus. He wants to purify himself because he's already saved. It's an ongoing desire, action to be like the Lord. A person who lives or commits sin, living, following after sin, living in the practice of sin, they are not born of God. Verse 10 is even more distinguishing. God's children do righteousness. The devil's children follow unrighteousness. They live that way. You say, what does this have to do with chastening? Well, an unsaved person is allowed to continue in the pursuit of their sin until they die. God doesn't step in. He continue, they just, that's how they live. Until they face him at the great white throne judgment, he does not judge them. He does not, you know, there, there's some natural consequences that come when, when you do sin. You know, some sins produce physical things like, you know, uh, lung cancer and these kind of things when you defile your body, things like that. But God doesn't step in as far as chastening. He's not their father. He, he waits for damnation for that. You know, that's rough. I don't seem to want to say that callously, but that's when they'll be judged, the unsaved. But on the other hand, folks, listen, a saved person's sin is already judged in Christ They will never be condemned for that sin. But daily Christ in them and his seed that is inside of them will not tolerate them as children of God to continue practicing sin. In other words, he will stop them. There are two things here. He will stop them as we we look specifically. I want you to see verse number 9. You say, what are you talking about? Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin for God's seed. His seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. I want to argue with you the word cannot in that verse. The one reason he cannot is because he is born of God. He's a new creature. And when you're a new creature, you're going to want to do purity. So that's one reason he cannot. But there, from the harmony of other chastening passages, the other reason that he cannot is because God will stop him. Because God the Father has a threshold on his children. And he cannot continue in sin because God's going to step in and chasten him. And if he doesn't respond, frankly, as we saw this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he's going to kill him prematurely. You say, Pastor, you really believe that? Hey, listen, if I don't believe that that's true, I might as well chuck the whole Bible. It's, it's the verses of the Bible. You know, what, what can I say? It's what God said. It's exactly right. God has a threshold. The seed of Christ, that verse says, verse 9, is inside him. And he won't put up with habitual sinning from the Holy Spirit inside of you can only put up with so much continual habitual sinning. And then he's going to stop you. The spirit of Christ within you has a threshold. And when that divine threshold is reached, I don't know what number it is. I don't know what timing it is. I don't know how long it is. It's probably different from every person. It's, it's, it's divine. It's God knowing. Then God will step in and he will chasten you to correct you by all means. This is why believers may go years and years in certain sin and then it all comes crashing down on their head. During those years, they may think, well, you know, God's, God's not chastening me. You know, things are getting better. I'm getting promotions. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting more prosperous in life, living in sin. And, and then one day, it all comes crashing on their head because they're children of God, and God's threshold was reached of chastening. This is why some believers are chastened nearly immediately. You guys, some of you have told me stories that, God's threshold isn't very, you know, long with you. <laughs> you know, you start living in sin and he cracks you upside the head with a two by four. Praise the Lord, that's good stuff. The Lord determines when the chastening comes, but it always comes and it comes to every believer. We learned this morning that one of the reasons why he is patient with chastening because he wants you to self-chasten. He wants you to judge yourself. He wants you to look at verses in the Bible and at the end of of sermons and invitations and to deal and to obey and to bring yourself back into conformity. That's maturity. You know, there's a point that your children come to that you're hoping that, you know, that that you come to, you don't have to spank them after a certain age because they self-judge. 
They're growing. They're learning what is right and wrong. They, they feel repentant on their own. You've, 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 you've grown them maturely to that point where they understand it, and you don't have to spank them anymore, and you shouldn't spank them after a certain point. It's often that case with the Lord. For those who sin willingly and continually and call themselves believers, but they're unbelievers, God never stops them. There's a whole heap of people that call themselves Christians who do not know Jesus Christ. This passage, the, the Hebrews passage, is warning them. Listen, if you, are, if you were sons, you wouldn't be able to continue in sin. I'd chasten you. You're not. You're, you're a bastard. Whom the Lord loveth, he's chasing it. They're never chastened. They continue in willful sin day after day after day without exposure. First John in Hebrews says, they're not God's. They're not his children. Folks, hell will be filled with professing believers that really were bastards. They were members of Baptist churches and very religious and maybe even pastors and deacons and lived in secret sin at the same time. They were not of Christ or they would have not lived in habitual sin. They would have been disciplined by God at some point. And I beg you tonight, I just ask you straight out, I know you're a Sunday night committed crowd, I know that, but I beg you tonight, do you live in the habitual practice of sin without rebuke from God? You should fear you really should fear. If you can go month after month and year after year living in the same kind of sin and the Lord does not chasten you, you should let this passage rattle you. Seriously check if you're of the faith of Christ. This is a fearful thing. It should make every believer in this room fear under the view of Almighty God. God knows his children and he disciplines them. He certainly will chasten them if they remain in sin. Turn back, please, to Hebrews 12 passage, and we'll finish this out. And that idea of chastisement, continual chastisement, is what we need to discuss. This chastening is not trial sent down from God by random acts. Notice in verse number 5, this is Hebrews 12. Back to our text. You'll notice in verse number 5, in verse number 6, and verse number 9, very specific words, rebuked, scourgeth, subjection, these kind of words. These are not random things. This is not a crazy dad who comes home and he's angry and so he spanks the kid for no reason. This is very individual work that he's doing in your life. God's chastening is for the believer who will not judge himself and repent of sin in his life. It's for the Christian who allows ongoing sin and is hard-hearted and won't repent and turn away from that practice. And that's not always flaming sin. We think, oh yeah, God should chasten that guy because he's a fornicator. Or God should chasten that guy because he's a porn head. Or God should chasten that guy because he beats his wife. Well, listen, God's going to change you if you don't get rid of your pride. God's going to chasten you if you don't humble yourself. God's going to chasten you if you don't get, away, get, get rid of your dirty mouth. With the way you treat other people. The attitudes that you have. Always looking down at people, whatever. I'm showing you that it's not just the bad stuff. God is interested in his children being righteous in all areas of their life. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 31 through 32, that we, said, we read this morning, for we would judge ourselves. We would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. When a Christian goes on in his sin, that is, they will not judge themselves, then the Lord chastens them. And steps in, because they're not going to be condemned with the world. He promises to do it. The world, the unsaved people, are going to be condemned for their sin. Believers who sin, uh, who, who sin are not handled that way. They are chastened right here in this lifetime. That they might shape up and be righteous. And that they would pursue holiness again. I praise the Lord for many of you, as I said this morning, that are self-judgers. Be a self-judger. Be tender-hearted. When you're reading through your devotions about some sin area, when you're hearing preaching about some sin area, when someone comes to you about something in your life, be soft and change. Be soft and be repentant and confess it. Don't you dare get the dander on your back up and be defensive. God, chase your father will chasten you painfully for always being defensive and not dealing with what's going on in your heart. I often don't pub publicly talk about a situation that happened here. 
just a couple years after I became your pastor. It was a very, very dark time in my life just a few years after I came. There were very incredible pressures on me, most of them self-inflicted, about doing something, performing as a pastor with a group of people, Lighthouse, the nucleus that had come away from a rough situation and, you know, we're in a, a warehouse building and so, you know, I came, Amy and I came and there were just a lot of pressures about what the Lord was going to do with that group and how I was going to lead. This was my first senior pastor, as most all of you knew, and it worked on my heart. How would the Lord provide? It worked on my heart like, like uh, how would we get land? How would we ever come up with the money for it? How would we ever come up with the, the money to build a building? How would we organize the way that we're supposed to organize? How would we ever get out of the asphalt jungle of churchmen's, whatever that was called over there. Some of you know exactly what I'm, Churchman Center, thank you. The pressure built up a lot. There's nobody here that was bringing on the pressure, it was me. Others were looking at me, other guys would call, my friends, many of you wondering what was going to happen. It went from the pressure of, I wonder how God's going to do it, to I wonder if God can do it, to God can't do it in my heart. For many months, I kind of lived with the knowledge inside, smiling on the outside, preaching every Sunday. I live with the knowledge that one of these days, it's all going to fall apart, and someone is going, and I'm going to be exposed at who in the world voted to bring this West Virginia Yahoo here that can't leave his, his own self, let alone people in a church. And day after day, I would think sinful, lying thoughts that I'm sure the devil helped me think that this can't be done. It's just a matter of time before it unravels and we disband the church. The Lord allowed me to go for some length of time thinking that way so that I would self-judge. But I didn't. And I don't know exactly where it was in that process. But the Lord cut my legs out from under me. And though many of you did not know it, I went through about an entire year at least of horrible, horrible dark depression. I could not study. I could not enjoy my family. I could only be in the office. I, I physically hurt incredibly. All the while thinking, this cannot be done. Somewhere deep into those months, a lot of things, different things happen. Some of you have heard this testimony but I hit the bottom. And I found, like the quote in Pilgrim's Progress when they're crossing the river, that it was firm, that the bottom was firm, that God could be relied on. That experience changed my life tremendously. And I went from thinking, it can't be done, to God is powerful. And God is in this thing. And I have nothing that I can add to it. It's kind of like salvation. I just throw myself on you, God. You do it. Now, some of you look at me and you kind of judge me because you were here during that time. But with all respect that I can muster, it's a lot of different when the buck stops with you. And we stand tonight in the building that God built. Millions of dollars later, literally millions of spent dollars later, God providing land, God providing this. 
Did it ever occur to you, you who have been here, if not those of you who don't understand this reference, you know, you need to ask the people who have been here, did you ever think about that this building is exactly on Mrs. Sears' backyard? We did not get this property with the purchase of this property. Why am I saying this? Because chastisement is good. I'm telling you, I've been opening my heart, and I'm telling you that I praise the Lord now for that sweet, horrible year. Why did God do that? Because he wanted to mess with me? No, because he loved me. Our God spanks hard. I've got a page and a half left, but we're ending there tonight. And I just want you to consider this passage, and I want you to consider there are some of you that are messing with stuff you don't, that you should not be messing with as a child of God. And you ignore the morning message. And you think you can handle sin. Sin is not to be handled, it's to be repented of. Your God is holy, your Father is good. He wants to refine you. He wants to make you holy like Jesus is holy. Nothing between my soul and my Savior. Not of this world's delusive dreams. I've renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is king. There's nothing between. That's how he wants us to live every day. Now God's chastening will come. I don't know his threshold in your life. But won't you self-judge? Radical amputation of sin Desire for God's holiness within. Purifying yourself as Jesus is pure. Would you stand please to your feet?